Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Matthew. Think about Matthew and who he is and what he did and so forth. Well, this particular lesson is lesson number nine in that series for May 28 of 2016. It's entitled, a very interesting title, Idols of the Soul and Other Lessons from Jesus. So this is a kind of a catch basket of things in between. Not, not one huge thing, but several lesser things, lessons from Jesus. So um, before we begin, I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to be looking primarily at, at uh, uh, Matthew 19 and 20, so it shouldn't be too hard to follow along. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we just wish that we could have a 3D living color uh, panoramic view of each of these stories. Try to imagine, and someday we, we know that will be possible. We try to imagine what it would have been like to be one of these disciples, one of the other followers of Jesus, having li to live through all these experiences, and yet we know that the day is coming that we will have the privilege not just to follow Jesus on this earth, but to follow him in heaven. We look forward to that day, and may it come soon as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start out by reading Matthew 18, 1 to 4. And I have my good news Bible here. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, why were they asking that question? Compare themselves. Do I measure up? Because Jesus had stopped them on just recently before, a little while before that, saying, what are you arguing about? And they'd been arguing about who was going to be greatest. So now they come to Jesus with that question. So what does Jesus do? Well, he said, Peter, of course, right? No, that's not what he said. What did he say? Jesus called a child, made him stand in front of them and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. What are we supposed to learn from that? Which characteristic of a child is it that he's advocating? Yeah. And after you've seen a few two or three-year-olds who are totally undisciplined, you wonder which child he was talking about. <laughs> well, well I, I think uh, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. The king, uh, and uh, Jesus said he came to do the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really uh, summarizes, in a sense, what the kingdom of heaven is about, is doing the will of the Father. And so a, a child is, is brought up to do the will of the Father, whether that plays out because of our humanity or not, but that's at least that's the paradigm uh, that's supposed to exist between the father and the child. Well, let's be honest now. Every one of us is born naturally selfish. As infants, infants, all we can think about is our own personal needs, and we squawk and we carry on until we get what we need, what we think we need. That is normal for a small baby. But at what point are we supposed to grow out of that selfishness and gradually learn more of the values, morals, and standards of God's kingdom? To most of us, this is a puzzling illustration, the one that we just read from Jesus. What does it really mean to become like a little child? And I quote from Ellen White here. This is from Desire of Ages, page 437, paragraph 1 and 2. It was not enough for the disciples of Jesus to be instructed as to the nature of his kingdom. He's not going to just tell them about the kingdom. What, what they needed was a change of heart that, they would, that would bring them into harmony with its principles. Calling a little child to him, Jesus set him in the midst of them. Then tenderly folding the little one in his arms, he said, I mean, imagine a small child who later could say, I was hugged by Jesus. He said, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The simplicity, the self-forgetfulness, and the confiding love of little child are the attributes that heaven values. These are the characteristics of real greatness. 
Now, I would like to help. It's not the gullibility. Not the gullibility. I would like to, to, for us to think about this for a moment. What is the most important characteristic of a child? Think about a child physically, mentally, spiritually, psychologically, or whatever. What is the important thing about a child? Capacity to grow. Is capacity to grow. When we get to heaven, will God be ready to welcome people to heaven who are stuck in a rut and don't want to grow? Nope. I don't think so. They'd have, they have no willingness or interest in learning. So what so, can God do with them? Yeah. So a person who is eager to learn, eager to grow, will have the simplicity, the self-forgetfulness, and the confiding love of a child. So they're saying the people who go to heaven will say, Jesus, teach us. We want to know. We want, like a little child. I, I have a uh, two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, and she's just learning to speak. Her, um, her mother is actually from France. And her father, of course, is an American. And so this little girl is learning to speak French and English. So it's very interesting for us to watch how she, because her mother speaks to her French all the time, and so she speaks French quite well. But learning her to speak English, for her to speak English. And so you see something happen, and you say to her a few words in English, and what's her response? She repeats those words exactly the way you said them. Well, it, even the most recalcitrant child uh, is inclined, at least at the age that we're kind of picturing them here, to to return to the parent for mm -hmm. for, support, for love, support, for nurturance. Um, so there's a for guidance for for. Um, learning for observations on how to to do things yep. i read on and again again jesus explained to the disciples that his kingdom is not characterized by earthly dignity and display at the feet of jesus all these distinctions are forgotten the rich and the poor the learned and the ignorant meet together with no thought of caste or worldly preeminence all meet as blood-bought soldiers souls alike dependent upon one who has redeemed them to God, Desire of Ages 4, 37, 1 and 2. In other words, everyone comes to cross and they say, Jesus, we want to know more. Teach us. No matter where they came from, doesn't matter. We want to learn. So, if God is, needs to prepare people for his kingdom, what kind of characteristics does he have to engender in them? Humility. Humility. Philippians 2 have this attitude which was yeah, in, in Christ exactly. Jesus. There won't be any place for selfishness at the foot of the cross. And there will be no place for selfishness in the kingdom of heaven. Are we ready to recognize that? Greatness in the sight of God will be found in those who adopt Christ's plan for their lives and become truly loving. If we grow to be more like Jesus, it will be a natural consequence. It will show itself in our external behavior. Have you seen any people walking around that remind you of Jesus? You don't everybody talk at once. Oh, well, from time to time, they remind me of Jesus, but not always. Not all. I see. Time. Well, think about this. How many of us would think of using a small child as an example of greatness? Well, I can brag on my grandchildren, but... <laughs> I think that's a little different. Yeah. Um, it's very unlikely that at any point in our lives, we would just naturally look at a small child and, I want to be like that. So, as Dennis has already mentioned, God is apparently looking for humility, willingness to learn and willingness to grow. When we are humble, it is easier to serve others. Think of the example of Moses, and I'd like to just read those verses very quickly. Numbers 12, 1 to 3. Moses had married a Cushite woman, and Miriam and Aaron criticized him for it. Now, that, of course, was Jethro's daughter. 
they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? So what are they trying to say? We're as good We're as Moses. Good. We're as good as Moses. They're trying to, this is, a self, this is pure selfishness. The Lord heard what they said, and then there's parentheses, and by the way, who is responsible for the writing of this book? Moses. Moses. And where did he get the information from? God. God. This is God inspiring Moses to say, what did he say? Moses was a humble man, more humble than anyone else on earth. And I can tell you that there are other passages from Scripture suggesting this. And Ellen White says very specifically, humility was not looked up to in any of those ancient cultures. Nobody wanted to be humble. So when Moses said he's the humblest man on earth, he wasn't bragging. Okay? Think of some times in the Bible when a little humility would have made a huge difference. Do you think it would have made a difference when Adam and Eve were tempted at the tree? When at least Eve was, and then later she went to Adam? What would have been different if she had been very humble? What do you think? I, I, I have a suggestion. See what you think of this. I have said... What Eve should have said to the serpent was simple. Easy to, you know, easy to pay Monday morning quarterback, mm -hmm. right? Um, she should have said, okay, maybe what you've said is true. But this tree has been here as long as I've been around. So I will go home, I will discuss, I mean, I will go back, I will discuss it with Adam, and I will discuss it with God, and if it's a good idea to eat this fruit, I will be back tomorrow and the tree will still be here. Of course, that's not what the serpent wanted her to do. It's not, right? what, any, it's not what any salesman wants you to do. Yeah, not exactly. Do it now. <laughs> okay. Because you may come to your senses later. Yes. We all know very well that not every small child is humble and obedient, but some are. Do we naturally possess attributes, characteristics, attitudes, or ideas that are contrary to the kingdom of God and could not be accepted into the heavenly kingdom? Paul lists a whole bunch of them. <laughs> His yeah, I was about to say, don't say, don't speak up now, but speak, think for yourself. <laughs> yeah, okay. How many of our traits are not appropriate, would not be appropriate in, in the heavenly kingdom? The very essence of Satan's kingdom is a desire to have one's own way, that is, to be selfish. God's kingdom is based on love and the desire to do others good, to serve others. How many of our actions and thoughts every day are motivated by selfishness and how many are motivated by love? I won't ask anyone to give us a percentage or anything like that. I just want you, and you out there, ask, ask the question of yourself. If, if a person did everything that they did, conducted their lives in such a manner that it was always loving, would they be ever sin? Well, in answer, I would like to use the words of Jesus. He said, if you have love for one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And love is the fulfilling of the law, right? Yep, Romans When 13. those who don't have the law do what the law requires so that the law is written on their heart. R Romans 2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I look after somebody for what I can get out of them. I'm not looking at them in love. Yeah. So if I look at them in love, then that sort of neutralizes that. So carnal, what was? Wh I'm sorry. Yeah, that carnal impulse. Yeah. What was one of the very first res uh, results of that interaction at the tree of knowledge of good and evil? A breakdown in interpersonal relationships. And so what happens? Adam blames Eve, and Eve blames the serpent. serpent. And both of them, by implication, blame God. God immediately. Wow. Well, look at Matthew 18, 15 to 35. Now, we're not going to take time to read the whole thing. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault, but do it privately just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you so that every accusation may be upheld 
by the testimony of two or more witnesses. As the scripture says, and if he will not listen to them, then tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan and a tax collector. And who's writing this? The tax collector. The tax collector. Well, we're supposed to treat them with love then, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What kinds of uh, breaches of human relationships does this apply to? Well, I think any kind that's obviously not according to God's plan. H how would things be different in the Adventist church in 2016 if we really practiced this? Well, of course the implication, well, the implication is is uh, that you're going to get some response here almost. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the idea. If you begin this step-by-step -step process, you're going to get a resolution to the problem. But uh, one, yeah, and let me just speak to that before you go on. <clears throat> right in the middle of this, in Matthew 18, 20, there's some very interesting words. Look at these words. For when two or, where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. So is he talking about when you come together to resolve one of these problems, God will be with us? Well, it, it say, he says, uh, if your brother s sins. So, so the sisters, you don't have to well, do this for I, sisters? Of course. <laughs> Certainly but, the Gentiles. But it's talking about uh, people who are close. In mm -hmm. other words, you have a relationship with them, uh, so you're just trying to, uh, you already have an inroad with them. Mm -hmm. You know, you know each other, mm -hmm. and you're trying to restore uh, them to, to a closer walk with God. Mm -hmm. or you're concerned about their, their situation. So when, when Paul talks about it in Galatians 6, 1, he says, uh, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. And I think when he says, lest you be tempted, he's talking about look at your own sinfulness so that you don't condemn them because of their weakness. It's not. That sounds a little, by, a little bit like Jesus' argument about logs in your eye, doesn't it? Something like that. It's all <laughs> part of the whole thing. Yeah. And if you read on there in Galatians 6, he says you're not only supposed to do that, you're supposed to bear one another's burdens. Yeah. yeah. Of course, there is, a, when we read this, we're, we're reading this um, as advice on how to come to a civilized approach to justice. Mm -hmm. But there may be something deeper here. There may be something to do with um, a growth or an improvement of human relationships. Okay. There may be an opportunity here for a, a growth um, between um, these individuals and God. Mm -hmm. am, am I, doesn't seem like I'm really phrasing that quite as, as like well, I would like to, but I... The, I, the next surprising thing, right in the same story, just going yeah. right on to the next verse, Peter asked Jesus, okay, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother? Is it seven times? And what did Jesus say? Seventy times. Seventy times seven. So that means if I get to 491, I don't have to forgive him? No, it's always be, and th that's the way God is. He's always forgiving. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many times Bible translations, they have hey, Jesus' death and this such as that is for forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. No, it's for remission is what, a much better way because sin is described in the Bible as a disease. Mm -hmm. And if you have a disease, what do you need? Healing. You need healing. You don't need, uh, everybody's forgiven, whether it's Hitler or Idi Amin or... Stalin, so what, any other bad guy. How many times am I just going to write off the fact <coughs> that Myra's not paying me the rent that she owes me all the time? She <laughs> keeps, she keeps skipping she the rent. You know, all the time. Four hundred and ninety-nine <laughs> months we're going on here. I don't collect the rent. What? And that no problem when I'm not able to pay my bills, and I just go to the people that I owe my, and they're going to tell them, "Hey, look, you know, you need to forgive me these 499 times." 
Okay, what, what, what? I, I, I don't think this is supposed to apply to business debts. Jesus is saying you need to be loving and kind and forgiving because that's how God is. Mm -hmm. You may forgive Myra, but you may still have to, you know, say, move on, I need my house. Yeah. Mm, I see. So what about somebody that's doing something wrong in the church? Well, we can forgive them, but... Mm -hmm. It seems to me the basic principle outlined here is fine, but what, ab what about the variation in the size of churches? A bit harder to apply it. Yeah. You get a great huge church, it's difficult. If you've got a small community where everybody knows everybody, it's a little easier to apply that. Well, that's why we try to have small groups, even in the, you know, the Loma Linda University churches, yeah. pretty, you know, it's, I think it's the largest, isn't it? Yes. Could be. And so there's workings to try to have smaller groups or to have people who sit in the same pews to kind of press together in, a, mm -hmm. in the sense of yep. getting to know each other and greeting and um, inviting people home for lunch and all of these kinds of things. Like Ellen White said, press mm -hmm. together, press together. Mm -hmm. We need to get closer, but we tend to just drift further and further apart or get pulled further and further apart. How, how, how should we as human beings feel when we, when we think about that final week in Christ's life and what happened there in Jerusalem? In light of what we've just read? In light of what we've just read. How fair was the trial of Jesus? And the re I, I hope you know where I'm going. When he's being nailed to the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What kind of forgiveness is that? Divine. Well, is there any time when you really know what you're doing? Well, I guess that's a fair question. The interesting part is that the way God relates to us, Paul talks about it in Ephesians 3. Look at that for a moment. Ephesians 3, starting with verse 8. I am less, this is Paul talking, I am less than the least of all God's people. I certainly want you to, wouldn't want you to think that I am less. Than, no. Paul, Paul repeatedly makes statements like this, and we know that's not true. When Ellen White says, I'm the lesser light, we need to take that in the same, term, same kind of understanding. Yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. This is God's plan of salvation, right? God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, who does that include? All of us the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. God intends for the angels of heaven to learn something about him from us. What could they possibly learn from us? Is that a total stumper? Well, make sure you do the right thing. What? <laughs> How many of us are doing the right thing? Well, I wouldn't be think that, wouldn't be thinking that's something that they would learn from us. Phrase that differently. Make sure you don't do the wrong thing. <laughs> okay. Well, like in the song where uh, angels never knew the joy that our salvation brings. You know, we our expression. You know, they can't uh, join in that song, but they can witness the joy that yeah. that salvation brings to us. Well, I, I would like to put that in a slightly different light. I agree with you there. What they're seeing is another side of God. When he deals with them, they're all perfect. They're doing God's will. They're loving, they're kind, they're forgiving if they need to be forgiving. There's no problem with them. But when they look at us, what are they seeing? Rebellion. They're seeing God dealing with rebellion, with selfishness, with all kinds of awful characteristics, and they're saying, God, I mean, if you were an angel, wouldn't you be saying, why are you putting up with these characters? We studied about that a few lessons ago, if you remember. 
So they're seeing a different side of God as he relates to sinners than they ever see in, they ever see in heaven. Well, our next section of this lesson is about the rich young ruler. Matthew 19, starting with verse 16. Once a man came to Jesus, teacher, he asked, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you ask me concerning what is good, answered Jesus. There is only one who is good. Keep the commandments if you want to enter life. Now, is Jesus saying if you just keep the commandments, you can earn salvation? No. no doesn't it sound like that? Well, the young man says, what commandments, he asked. Jesus answered, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not accuse anyone falsely, respect your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Where did those commandments come from? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, except the last one. I have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else do I need to do? And so, if you had stopped the picture right there, boom, stop. If you had asked the young man what he thought about himself, what would he say? I must be saved. I mean, there, you know, I'm rich. And, and what did that mean to a Jew? You're blessed. Let's just back up here a little bit. God is blessing you. He could not have imagined that Jesus would tell him to sell all that he had, which in the eyes of the Jewish people was proof that he was a good man, and give it all to the poor. To the Jew, if one was a good person, God would bless her or him, and she or he would be rich. If one was a bad person, God would curse her or him, and she or he would be poor. So in their eyes, it was easy to tell who the good people were. So you drive down the street in a Mercedes, and what do you, what do you know? You're a good person, right? <clears throat> Clearly, God's blessing you. Well, isn't that what the Bible says? I mean, we, when we read about Jacob and, man, all those, the growth of his flocks, it says that God was blessing him. Is it? And, and Abraham was blessed, yeah. and so, I mean, is that, is that the Bible writers uh, telling the story of Abraham and misinterpreting that God wasn't blessing those I'm warnings? I'm reminded of what Ellen White says about Abraham. He had a thousand, more than a thousand, heads of households in his, in, in his circle of people who worked for him. More than a thousand. He had 318, we know, men who are trained for war working for him. And she says that every day, or, or nearly every day, he would call them around his, his, his altar and teach them about God. Try to imagine that scenario. Well, but nevertheless, it's so because of that, God blessed him and he got all this stuff. Got these Mercedes camels and, <laughs> and Rolls Royce donkeys or yeah, whatever. Exactly. Well, was he doing what God wanted him to do? Well, well th look th at th the story of Job. That, that's the argument. If yeah. I'm, I've got all of this stuff, so I must be doing what God is wanting me okay, to do. Okay, look at the story of Job. Who's arguing that, who's making that argument in the book of Job in chapter 1? Well, but Job is different. No, well, Job is, is not the different. The philosophy there is, and it's current today. <laughs> <laughs> Who came to God and said, well, God, look at how you're blessing him. Of course he's faithful to you, right? This was Satan's argument. Well, Isaiah 53. Surely we, he is born of Greece, carried our sorrows. He, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. I mean, it, it's, even the Creator, 2,000 years ago, they rejected him because he didn't look like they thought he should look. Yeah. Well, this ruler, I'm now quoting from Ellen White, this ruler had a high estimate of his own righteousness. Of course, we can see that. He did not really suppose that he was defective in anything. Yet he was not altogether satisfied. He felt the want of something that he did not possess. Could not Jesus bless him as he blessed the little children and satisfy his soul want? In reply to this question, Jesus told him that obedience to the commandments of God was necessary if he would obtain eternal life. And he quoted several of the commandments which showed man's duty to his fellow man. 
The ruler's answer was positive. All these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And so what do you think he was expecting Jesus to say? What do you think he expected at that point? Big pat on the back. You don't lack anything. That a boy. At, at least that, or maybe Jesus should have given him one more thing to do, and he would have gone off happy. Okay, I'm doing the last thing. I'm, I'm, I've got my ticket, right? Christ looked into the face of the young man as if reading his life. This is still from Ellen White. As if reading his life and searching his character. He loved him. Christ loved this young man. And he hungered to give him that peace and grace and joy which would materially change his character. One thing thou lackest, he said, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross, there he is mentioning the cross again, and follow me. Christ has drawn to this young man, Christ was drawn to this young man, he knew him to be sincere in his assertion, all these things I have kept from my youth up. He, he, he believed it. He really believed that. The Redeemer longed to create in him that discernment which would enable him to see the necessity of heart devotion and Christian goodness. He longed to see in him a humble and contrite heart, conscious of the supreme love to be given to God and hiding its lack in the perfection of Christ. Jesus saw in this ruler just the help he needed if the young man would become a collaborator with him in the work of salvation. Isn't that incredible? If he would place himself under Christ's guidance, he would be a power for good. In a marked degree, the ruler could have re represented Christ, for he possessed qualifications which, if he were united with the Savior, would enable him to become a divine force among men. Kind of like Paul. Mm-hmm. Christ, seeing into his character, loved him. Love for Christ was awakening in the ruler's heart, for love begets love. Jesus longed to see him, a co-laborer co with him. Now, sometimes we look at this story and Jesus said, ah, you know, rich young man, no place in the kingdom, go away. You know, we sometimes have a little bit of that kind of attitude. No, Christ was awakening love in this ruler's heart. For love, Jesus longed to see him, a co-worker with him. He longed to make him like himself a mirror in which the likeness of God would be reflected. He longed to develop the excellence of his character and sanctify it to the master's use. If the ruler had then given himself to Christ, he would have grown in the atmosphere of his presence. If he had made this choice, how different would have been his future. And what did Jesus say? One thing thou lackest, come and follow me. Jesus read the ruler's heart, only one thing he lacked, but that was a vital principle. He needed the love of God in the soul. This lack, unless supplied, would prove fatal to him. His whole nature would become corrupted. By indulgence, selfishness would strengthen. That he might receive the love of God, his supreme love of self, must be surrendered. Desire of Ages 5.18 Paragraph 4 up to 519, paragraph 4. So what are we supposed to learn from that story? Can't have anything more important in your life than, than Christ, than God. If, if and, money is what I worship, then it's going to keep you from God. Yeah. How many people in the world living today put Jesus number one in their lives? A remnant. A remnant. If that many. Was Jesus really trying to suggest that if we keep the commandments, we could be saved? It almost sounds like that in part of one verse. If that were the only criteria, this young, rich, this young rich ruler might have been ready for the kingdom. But especially in Paul's writings, we see that keeping the law does not bring us salvation. Rather, what does it do? It points to our need of salvation. For, in, for example, in places like Romans 3.28. Remember, after explaining the gospel very clearly, what does, Jesus, what does Paul say? For we conclude that a person is put right with God only through faith, and not by doing what the law commands. Or is God the God of the Jews only? If he's not the God, is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Of course he is. God is one, and he will put the Jews right with himself on the basis of their faith, 
and will put the Gentiles right through their faith. Does this mean that, that by this faith we do away with the law? Now we're, the law doesn't seem to matter anymore, right? No, not at all. Instead, we uphold the law. So how can that be? He seems to be contradicting himself. How do those go together? Well, you said that the law shows our need. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we come to God, then that law becomes written in our heart as well. And in the previous chapter, he talks about how the Gentiles who do these things instinctively show that it's written on their hearts. So uh, God is no respecter of persons. He lets his sun shine on the wicked and the, the good and lets the rain fall. So anyone who with an open heart comes to God can reflect that. If Paul puts it this way in Romans 7, verse 7. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was a law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Apart from the law, sin is a dead thing. And he goes on to explain that whole process. So, where do we stand in all this business? For the gospel to be effective, the love of God and an understanding of his kingdom must so penetrate our lives and our thinking that nothing else will stand in the way of our serving him. How do we get to that position? That's a tough one, right? Work of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Many people down through the generations have thought that this story had to be wrong. But it is interesting to notice that, that as recorded in Luke 19, 1 to 10, shortly after the telling of the story, another rich man did get the point and joined the kingdom of, of God. So let's go there for a second. Luke 19, 1 to 10. Jesus went on into Jericho. Now, what, are we what time in the, in the story of Jesus are we talking about here? He's on his way up to Jerusalem in his last journey. Okay, this is one week or maybe a one week and one day or something before his crucifixion. So Jesus went on into Jericho and was passing through. There was a chief tax collector there named Zacchaeus who was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was a little man and could not see Jesus because of the crowd. So what did he do? He ran ahead of the crowd, climbed a up in a sycamore tree to see Jesus, who was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Hurried down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay in your house today. I, I try to imagine all the people from Jericho who are out to see this this great guy pass through. And every one of them thought, maybe, maybe he just might come to my house. And whose house does he end up going to? The worst sinner in town, as far as they were concerned, right? The worst sinner in town. Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. All the people who saw it started grumbling. This man is going as a, as a guest to the home of of a sinner. And how did Jesus respond? After Zacchaeus tells about how he's going to give things away, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So here we are, seeking and saving the lost, right? Yes, Gordon. Why is it not Matthew, the other tax collector that writes about Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus? I was thinking about asking that question, but I wasn't sure if I should. Good question. Well, Isis was Jericho was part of the Jewish nation, right? Yes. So, is Zac Zacchaeus maybe not a Jew that's collecting taxes from the he Jews, Jew. or is he a Jew? He's a Jew. Jesus said he was a Jew. Yeah. I'm going to have to ask Matthew that. Why didn't you include that story? So, at the end of all this, what happens? Peter spoke up. Look, he said, we have left everything and followed you. 
what will we have? What do you think of that question? Does this question bother you? Or is this a selfish question? And I guess stepping back for a second, look at your, each one of us, look at ourselves. Are we more like the rich young ruler or are we more like Zacchaeus? Or as our children used to say, Zacchaeus. Let you think about that one for a while. Well, coming back to Peter's question, was that a selfish question? You know, what am I going to get out of this, Lord? Right? It's a natural... I, I, the way they were thinking, that's... You know, it's a natural question. And what was Peter hoping he would say? Well, you get to be prime minister, right? Maybe vice president. Vice president? Maybe so. Secretary of State. Well, they sit on th 12 thrones, he says. So there's, there's at least some recognition there, something yeah. judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. Well, that's coming up. We haven't got there yet. Yeah. Well, you know, the story of uh, James and John's mother. We're going to come to that as well. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, was Peter just saying, you know, I'd just like to know, was this, was this a selfish question or just say, okay, we're following you, Jesus, but I'd kind of like to know where we stand in all this. Was that just a casual question or was it a selfish question? Well, I think a family man, if he was halfway decent, he'd be asking a question like that. Mm -hmm. Well, probably I also had not only some, some questions about their individual roles later on, but may have had some questions about you know, where, where is this thing going, period? Yeah, exactly. Beginning to th get the idea here that this may not be quite what we have are anticipating here. <laughs> you think so? Well, I have a, a, a broader question. What about Peter's family? There must have been other disciples who were also married. What, what about their families, their wives, their children? When Peter left home and said, bye, I'm following Jesus, did his wife say, hold on just a minute. Who's going to pay for the bread? Who's going to, who's going to bring in the fish? He left that boatload of fish to, to pay for the next, next several months. I see. So every, every few months he's going to come back and collect another boatload of fish? There were no cool stores in those days. It didn't last long. <laughs> Well, he, he, if he managed to sell all those fish, he might have collected enough money to last for a little while. And they seemed to have enough to get along. There seemed to be women who followed, who ministered mm -hmm. to them, and they had a purse that Judas kept uh, track of that was supposed to be given to the poor. So they, there must have been some, some things that aren't just brought out in detail. And Matthew here. is the one who has a wife. But he's not the one who records these words from Luke chapter 8. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. Now, this is talking about basically the same time we're talking about right now. Preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healing, healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So I'm going to ask my usual question. How would you feel about your pastor traveling around with some high society women and former, former demon-possessed prostitutes? No problem, right? I think it would raise some eyebrows here and there. <laughs> eyebrows? And considering what happened to most of the disciples, I think it's fair to think that some of the family probably didn't have much to live on. They've sacrificed somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe those loaves and fishes that were left over after those <laughs> feedings, maybe they... Kept multiplying? Yeah, maybe they kind of... And, you know, I hadn't thought about that big load of fish that they caught that time. You know, just a miracle. We always talk about the, what was it, 53, 
fish. 100, 153 fish there, and uh, we just think, oh, well, that's some little trick, but maybe, you know, maybe there was a purpose to that as yeah. well. Maybe the, that was, was for those, you know. Let me ask you another question. I just asked about these women. How did the disciples feel about traveling around with these women? Who knows? I don't think there's any record, is there? Do we have any evidence that, I mean, Mary Magdalene pops up repeatedly, right? Is there any evidence that the disciples thought it was just fine for her to be tagging along? Well, our percep perception of where these people stayed as well, usually we think, of, well, they're just stuck out there in some cornfield by the side of the road or something all of the time, but maybe that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. If it was customary for strangers to be welcomed into strangers' homes, then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that was, that was... Yeah. You ladies go over here, we'll go over here. That's the way it worked. Maybe well, the women paid for the, uh, for the motels. They seem to be the ones with the money. Yep. Do you think it was a rich young man's experience, a rich young ruler's experience that triggered Peter's question? It's, it, 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 it follows right there in the sequence. You think God miraculously cared for the families of the disciples? Now later, Paul, remember, says Peter was traveling around the Mediterranean with his wife. Well, they, you know, Paul went around collecting offerings and things, so... And he took their offerings back to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Right, so they were probably offerings. It was all right for Peter to collect offerings and pay for the support of his wife? Paul says it was. Paul said it was. No. Okay, now let me, does the question from Peter suggest that he was still hard-hearted and spiritually dense? I mean, it could, you could look at that question and say, this guy is selfish, couldn't you? All he's, all he's interested in what he's going to get, uh, is interested in is what he's going to get out of it. Well, the spiritual life of One the Christian. can ask yeah. a question like that and not be selfish. Just want to know where we're going with this relationship, Jesus. Okay. The spiritual life or the Christian life is not easy, but God has promised us great rewards in the future, even eternal life. So, what happens next? Look at Matthew 19, starting with verse 28. Jesus said to them, you can be sure that when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne in the new age, so now what's he talking about? Kingdom of glory. When Kingdom of glory. Again. He's talking about something which we know now is going to be way in the future. Then you 12 followers of mine will also sit on thrones, and this is what you mentioned earlier, Dennis, to rule the 12 tribes of Israel. And they said, amen, let's do it. Why not start now, right? Isn't that what they thought? Amen. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times more and will be given eternal life. But many who now are first will be last and many who are now, who now are last will be first. So what does it mean to get a hundred times more? I hope that doesn't mean a hundred wives. A class distinction. <laughs> or a hundred husbands. Or a husband. Yeah, that would be even worse. No. What, what's he talking about here? Do we understand these words? It's one of those things you've got to get there self to see. Well, if you bring uh, souls to the kingdom, you know, Jesus said, pointed to the people around him and said, Behold, when they said, your, your brothers are here and your mother's here, and he says, Behold, my brothers and my sisters and my mother, you know. So if you lose those few, uh, in the kingdom, you have uh, these many brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a broader, uh, th that could be where the hundredfold comes in. Yeah. Well, so Jesus tells a story. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. 
They're out there cutting grapes. He went out again to the marketplace at 9 o'clock and saw some men standing there doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard and I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. They didn't argue, they didn't negotiate, they just went. Then at 12 o'clock and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same. It was nearly 5 o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing, he asked them. No one hired us, they answered. Well, then you also go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who, hi who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. He's just, I mean, isn't he intentionally fight, cause, trying to stir up a, a riot? The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men who were at the first, who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get much, they would get more. But they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun, yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the owner answered one of them, I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a, a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who is hired last as much as I gave you. Don't you have the right to do as I want with my money, wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I'm generous? Does that feel, feel, make you feel really good about fairness? Well, and then the, la the next verse, thus the last shall be first and the first last, because it, that expression brackets this with verse mm -hmm. 30 from the previous chapter. Yeah. So there's this sense that many who come first to the field, they, they could be last. Uh, and those who are, come late to the party, they may end up okay, first. Let's, let's think about some ways in which the first would be last. The guys who went home, who worked, went to work first, worked all day long, went home with their silver coin, what do you think they had to say to their families? Well, they grumbled. They grumbled. The guys who came last and worked one hour and went home and talked to their families, what did they have to say? What did they say about the, about the employer? Wow, he was great. I'm going to go work for him again. That's a good tipper. Okay, when we work for God, what kind of an attitude does he want us to have toward him? An attitude like the five o'clock people or an attitude like the six o'clock in the morning people? Well, there's another, there's another group here. There are two other groups that are listening here. Mm -hmm. We've got the Jews who have been around a long time mm -hmm. and uh, who think that they're entitled to the kingdom because they have been around a long time. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Gentiles who have just kind of arrived on the scene and they get equal rights to the kingdom. Yeah. If you we're looking at the concept of salvation here, it's, it's available to everybody. It doesn't make any difference when you come, mm -hmm. you still get Still get One full ticket pay. to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than just do I get to go there or do I not. It, it's the, you know if you look at the parable of the talents or the cities, there's different uh, things. Jesus said, I, uh, "Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me." Well, what is what is the reward of the righteous? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's kind of I think what this is talking about. And and Paul quotes Jesus as saying. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So I think the reward of the righteous is really not what do I get, it's my capacity to give. Paul had some interesting words to say about those who are Christ's people. For 2 Timothy 3.12, everybody who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in? And if we go down here to reading that Matthew 20, 20 to 7 thing again, and we read Luke 9, 51 to 56 before it, as the time drew near, I'm, I'm using Luke as a preference here, as a, I mean a pre, anyway. As the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind to set out on his way to Jerusalem. He set 
excuse me, he sent messengers ahead of him who went into a village in Samaria to get everything ready for him. So what's happening here? Jesus is taking a circuitous route toward Jerusalem. And why is he doing this? Getting attention. He's getting attention of as many people as possible because you know, all the people are traveling with him. What are they saying to everybody who listens? See that guy over there? He's going to be the next king. And he's headed for Jerusalem and we're going to crown him king when he gets to Jerusalem. And we're going to get rid of the Romans. Don't you think they were saying that to everybody? And what does this lead to? Everybody wants to see what's going, what's going to happen to Jesus, right? And what does God want to happen? That's exactly what God wants to happen. He wants everybody. He wants as many eyes as possible to be focused on the, on the cross when Jesus is crucified. He doesn't want the, the tribes and the Pharisees to be able to do this quietly, secretly, in a corner somewhere and nobody knows about it. Well, so they're going through this village in Samaria when the disciples, uh, but the people there would not receive him because it was clear that he was on his way to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? As Elijah did, we might add it in some versions. Jesus turned and rebuked them. He says, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. Then Jesus and his disciples went on to another village. So, and what happened shortly thereafter? Peter, and we've already mentioned this, James and John with their mother came and said, could we please sit on your right and your left in the kingdom? And how do you suppose Jesus felt when they asked that question? Crushed. Jesus must have been very sad to think here were the people who were closest to him, the closest to him, and here they are making a, making a request like this. And he told them, you don't know what you're asking. Yeah. And when he was on the cross, there was a couple of, there was somebody on the right and the left. It's, it's God's plan that we become reflectors of Jesus. How well are we doing at that challenge? Have you ever tried to go directly to someone who was hurt, to, who had hurt you to see if you can settle the matter with him or her? The lessons we could learn from the events recorded in these chapters are incredible. How well are we doing? Have you ever tried it? Think about the lessons that we could learn from just these few passages and try them in your life. Our kind and loving Father, we have discussed some very challenging ideas in this lesson. Help us to think about how they might apply to our lives each day as we seek to serve you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.